with a roundtable discussion of Harvest of Shame, and we'll continue with a panel discussion in the Great Society of Rural Florida that begins at 4.30. Uh, my name is Elisa Minoff, for those of you I don't know. I've, I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of History, and I've helped organize this series of events along with Clarissa Kopitoff and others in the department. And the series is really designed to shine a light on this particular moment in American history, uh, the mid-1960s, when Congress and Johnson as president passed a raft of legislation, uh, mo sort of most, mostly focused on social policy and civil rights, or sort of most famously focused on social policy and civil rights, um, but also on sort of a whole wide range of, of issues. And uh, we want to look back at the policies and programs created during the Great Society and put them in their social and political context, consider how they affected the lives of Americans at the time, and then also consider what the legacies of these policies and programs are for us today here in Florida and across the country. Um, and just before we get started with today's program, I want to alert you to the events that are upcoming. <laughs> Tomorrow in Pointer Library, we're going to hear a panel on civil rights, cities, and the Great Society. And one of the uh, participants is going to speak about St. Petersburg. And another will talk about uh, Selma and Watts. On Thursday, after a few days of sort of looking backward at the 1960s, we're going to look forward and consider future anti-poverty policy. And we're hearing from uh, Mark Greenberg, who's an assistant secretary at the Department of Health and Human Services. He's coming down to Florida, and he's going to be talking about the administration's plans for the future, and we're also going to be hearing from Gypsy Gallardo, who uh, works on anti-poverty policy here in St. Petersburg, and she'll be commenting on Greenberg's presentation and considering what needs to be done here in St. Pete. So then we finish off our week next Monday, where we have two events. The first is the keynote address by Annelise Orleck, The War on Poverty at the Grassroots, and then finally we're showing an excerpt from a just-released documentary on the Black Panthers. So I hope to see, see many of you at those other events. And um, this afternoon, this first session, we're having a roundtable discussion, but I want to wait until after the, we watch Harvest of Shame to actually introduce the panelists. Um, Harvest of Shame, which we'll be watching, was really sort of a path-breaking documentary at the time. It draw, draw a lot, drew a lot of attention to the plight of migrant farm workers. And I will be putting it in a bit of a historical context after we watch it um, and before we hear from other speakers about sort of the more recent problems uh, farm workers have faced in Florida. So without further ado, let's watch the documentary. Okay. Again to our round table. Uh, my name is Lisa Minoff, and I will now introduce our roundtable participants. At the far end, uh, we have Ella Schmidt. Let me just get my notes together so I don't miss it, I introduce anybody incorrectly. Okay, so Ella Schmidt is an associate professor here in anthropology. Ella has studied migrant farm workers and farm workers in Florida. Her first book is The Dream Fields of Florida, Mexican Farm Workers and the Myth of Belonging. That came out in 2009. Her current research focuses on indigenous migration from Mexico, and she's looking at a community of, of migrants who have traveled between Clearwater, Florida, and the Valle de Mezquital in Hidalgo, Mexico at the moment. And so her current research is about sort of the construction of, of citizenship and the communal sense of citizenship among these migrants. Uh, so we'll start with first me and then Ella, and then we'll move on to hear from Jeannie Economos. Jeannie has worked for 20 years in environmental justice, working on immigrant rights, indigenous workers' rights, uh, labor and social justice. Her work began with the Farm Workers Association of Florida in 1996 when she began working on the Lake Apopka project, uh, working with um, farm workers who were losing their jobs and becoming displaced and having health problems with the closing of farms near Lake Apopka. Her current work focuses on the health problems of migrants and specifically pesticide-related health problems of, uh, of farm workers around Lake Apopka in Central Florida. And um, she has also been involved in a, a sort of documenting the history 
of farm workers around Lake Apopka, and she'll talk a bit to us about that, as well as um, trying to memorialize those farm workers people think have been uh, killed by pesticides through a quilt project, which I hope she'll talk about briefly. Uh, finally, we'll hear from Leonel Perez. He is with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Uh, Leonel is originally from Guatemala, and he's a member of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And the coalition has worked um, for years now in order to forge agreements to, with food retailers, including McDonald's, Burger King, and Walmart, and um, really paving a way for a fair food program to raise the wages of people who pick food. Uh, and they've done a lot of work around specifically tomatoes. And the New York Times recently uh, called the Fair Food Program the best workplace monitoring program in the United States. And the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is also featured in a recent documentary, a documentary that's just come out called Food Chains, focusing on um, farm workers in the United States. And I'll show at the very end a brief trailer for that. And it's also going to be shown, I think, at a library here in town um, at 5 p.m., so right after this event, <laughs> for those of you who can't get enough of documentaries about very depressing subjects like farm workers. <laughs> um, OK, so, um, so I'm just going to offer a bit of historical context or placing harvest of shame in context, and then really turn it over to the rest of our panelists, who will take the story forward and talk about much more recent conditions for farm workers in Florida and across the country. I wanted us to watch Harvest of Shame as part of this series of events on the Great Society, not only because I think it helps us understand the condition of some of the most impoverished Americans in the 1960s, but also because the documentary itself was galvanizing. It helped bring public attention to this problem. And it aired the day after Thanksgiving. And I think the sort of symbolism of that moment is important. And I think it's difficult to underestimate the impact of Harvest of Shame. So I'm just going to make a couple of uh, brief remarks sort of trying to set Harvest of Shame in context and then offer a reflection or two on the impact of the documentary. So Harvest of Shame came on the heels of well over a decade of organizing and mobilizing on behalf of farm workers and farm workers organizing sort of formally through labor unions, um, but also the sort of mobilization of social welfare leaders and other reformers on behalf of uh, workers. The last years of the Depression through World War II were sort of years when a lot of uh, social welfare experts, uh, social scientists began to pay attention to farm workers. And over the course of the 40s and 50s, you saw two groups in particular really mobilized to help farm workers. And it, both were sort of referenced in Harvest of Shame. So the first group that was very active were a bunch of religious organizations. The Nat National Council of Churches, which was mentioned, sponsored a lot of state-level migrant ministries, which pro provided direct, sort of direct assistance, direct relief to migrants, also was involved in education of migrant children. Other religious organizations were involved, like um, the American Friends Service Committee, the National Catholic World Life Conference, and the National Council of Jewish Women, and, um, and, I, and others. Uh, so there were religious organizations, and there was also a, a sort of by the late 50s, organized labor was playing a larger and larger role in these conversations about farm workers. The AFL chartered the National Farm Labor Union in 1946, that sort of grew out of the Southern Tenants Farmers Union. And uh, as we saw by 1960, the agricultural workers um, were, were increasing the organized, especially in California. And the religious organizations and organized labor were by 1960 really sort of calling for um, a sort of organized agenda of like really three sets of reforms. One set of reforms to help sort of meet the immediate welfare needs of farm workers. The other set of reforms to include agricultural workers really in the sort of benefits of the New Deal welfare state, so get them access to unemployment insurance, minimum wage, guarantee them the right to organize, all the things that other workers were guaranteed by legislation passed in the 1930s, um, but agriculturalists were, ag agricultural workers were not. Um, so, uh, sort of, so welfare, they wanted um, to push for new welfare programs, also to include work migrant farm workers in the protective legislation of the welfare state, 
and to reduce, finally, foreign competition. So to end the Bracera program, which is very briefly mentioned in the Harvest of Shame report. Um, the Bracera program was, of course, established during World War II to help recruit work, foreign workers to come to the United States to fill what growers were calling it was a farm short labor shortage. Um, but that's, of course, arguable. And uh, by the late 50s, uh, labor and other reformers concerned with farm workers really strongly believed that the importation of foreign workers was driving down wages in the United States. So they were very strongly advocating for the end of the guest workers pro program. Um, so the point here is just to emphasize that there was a lot of mobilization going on even before Edward R. Murrow showcased the plight of migrant farm workers in 1960, the day after Thanksgiving. That this organization really made this sort of um, media attention possible. But I think um, the lesson of Harvest of Shame is also a lesson of how journalism, and specifically investigative journalism, can help fuel reform that's already in the works. Uh, one of the reasons I think Harvest of Shame was particularly effective was that it emphasized again and again throughout the program that these workers, farm workers, were citizens of the United States and were treated if, as if they weren't. Um, this imagery of the citizenship of, of the worker was sort of um, clear from the very beginning of the segment when you see the sort of roundup of workers and the voiceover saying, this isn't in South Africa, this um, isn't in the Congo, these are American citizens. And then um, in sort of, it seems immediately thereafter, you see that image of Mrs. Dobie, the white woman with all of those blonde children <laughs> sitting around her on the stoop. And I think that image in particular must have recalled in people's minds the the sort of migrant farm worker of the 1930s, the migrant farm worker depicted by Dorothea Lange in her photographs of the 1930s, the migrant farm worker in uh, The Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck's uh, famous novel, and of course the movie that came, out on, came after it. Um, so those images, I think, were still fresh in people's minds of the sort of all-American, the white all-American worker, um, and were, um, those images, I think, helped uh, both sort of garner sympathy and make it clear that these people were Americans like the people who were viewing the show. So it's both the sort of um, depiction of farm workers as white, but also the depiction of farm workers as African American. And I think both of those images are important. So you also see a lot of images in The Harvest of Shame of African American children, African American women, African American families. And of course, we have to remember that this is the moment at sort of the height of the civil rights movement. And when African Americans in the South are really pushing for their rights as citizens to be recognized. So I think it's significant that both the sort of two groups that are most um, highlighted in Harvest of Shame, I mean, they could have spent a lot more time going to California talking to Mexican American migrants, um, but instead they were focusing on African American migrants from the South and white migrants both of whom I think viewers would have seen as either sort of citizens or people struggling for their rights of citizenship to be recognized. Um, so these were Americans, and I think the response to Harvest of Shame was, uh, was, was so strong largely because of this idea that these were sort of Americans who were struggling. Um, so both the White House, the Department of Labor, and CBS were flooded with correspondence after the airing of Harvest of Shame. CBS alone received 2,700 letters uh, about the program, and the vast majority that at least CBS received were quite, was quite, were quite favorable about the program. After it aired, uh, a senator, a Democratic senator from Wisconsin, placed the entire transcript of the program in the congressional record. And uh, just a couple months later, the AFL-CIO sponsored a program for members of of viewing, I should say, for members of Congress. Um, and so the documentary began to be sort of um, passed on in, in circles in Washington, and it really helped, um, I think, uh, really get support for the legislation that would eventually be passed over the course of the 1960s, and we'll talk about this even more in the next panel. But Senator Harris and Williams 
who has mentioned, he uh, introduced a series of bills about migrant workers, uh, which were backed by the Kennedy administration. And then in 1962, Kennedy signed the Migrant Health Act. A few years later, later legislation was passed requiring crew leaders to register, including farm workers in the Fair Labor Standards Act, and finally ending the Bracero program. So um, there are a lot of reforms that were not enacted in the years following Harvest, Harvest of Shame. But I think looking back on Harvest of Shame 50 years later, or over 50 years later, it's important to think of it as sort of an evidence that media can help a long, long simmering ad advocacy capture the national attention of lawmakers in particular and get politicians to respond. Um, and partly by getting their often white middle class constituents to actually write in and um, call on them to respond and to actually take action. Just a couple of thoughts about today. I think today, for a number of reasons, um, this um, getting sort of action on this issue is, is more difficult. One reason is, uh, I think, the fragmentation of the media. I don't, I don't actually think something like frag the Harvest of Shame could have the sort of impact today that it had in 1960 when there were uh, so few networks and um, mo most Americans were getting their news from just a select few sources. Uh, and um, finally, I think the really real reason that this is um, this is a sort of much more difficult issue today than than it was in 1960 is um, this issue of the sort of the, the citizenship of the workers. Um, in the 1960s, at the peak of the civil rights movement, um, arguments about the rights of citizens were so powerful, and that's the language that advocates mm -hmm. use at the time. It's the language Murrow used in his address, and I think it's just a lot harder to find language that really um, gets people motivated to change the circumstances of uh, farm work in this country now. Um, so with those thoughts, I will pass the microphone down to Ella. So I need to, you cannot hear me without the mic. Um, I um, would like uh, to actually move forward. I mean, we need to see ourselves in 1990, in fact. And uh, Frontline actually put a documentary together that was aired also on Thanksgiving or the day after uh, called New Harvest of Shame. And they use excerpts of, of, um, of Morris. Uh, documentary. Uh, one of the striking uh, changes, or actually probably the only change, is the color of people's skins. And uh, with time, you know, the either white or black um, landscape became brown. Um, we need to also add to that the fact that many of the farm workers of our days are actually undocumented. So they have uh, no rights, uh, civil or otherwise, uh, because we don't consider them either citizens nor members of our society. In fact, we all know and we all read the news all the time as to how far, how far out these people are socially, culturally, and economically. It is very true that you know when those gas gasoline gypsies were going towards California, uh, and you know the legislatures would say, "Oh well, these people love this uh, life outdoors." And uh, there has been, there has been a lot of discussions about farm workers, especially Mexican and Central American uh, farm workers, who truly don't know any better, and they're actually very happy with what they have. In fact, they are very. Um, thankful for what uh, they're, they're being given. I um, worked in the mid-90s in uh, around Dade City, and I worked very, uh, with many uh, farm workers. And I would say that after 20-some years, the problems continue to be the same. Uh, we're talking about actually a more invisible population at this point, because they need to hide in a lot of ways, <coughs> and we don't want to see them either. So the camps many times are in um, 
entrances of, of homes. So you see the home, the house, and in fact, in the back, there are trailers in horrible conditions. And uh, of course, farm workers are paying a lot of money for that, uh, those um, accommodations, so to speak. Uh, but not only that, the uh, space where they live in, the stores where they go to buy their, their necessities, that space becomes also marked with poverty, with brownness, with alienation, with illegality, which is the term we like to use a lot. Um, at the level of schooling, it has not changed either. Many, actually many farm workers currently have been able to not, to stop migrating. So they, they stay put and, and their housing uh, conditions are not exactly optimal, optimal either. If, uh, you know, when I was doing my research in around the city, um, you know, they lived in the north side of the city, so you would have gone out of the very nice kind of old fashioned town, southern town, and you would get into these streets that were not paved, had no, no electricity, et cetera, et cetera. All that, the invisibility, the, the, the very uh, poor housing is also translated into a dismal education. Uh, these children would go to schools, would be already marked because of the poverty, uh, you know, the way they were dressed because they spoke very little English. And many of them would be put regularly and systematically, I would even dare to say, in special education programs for the emotionally handicapped, etc. And truly these children, what they had was actually um, lack of knowledge of, of, of the English language. In 1990 also, interestingly enough, um, the uh, State Department of Education in Florida was sued. And there was, um, the consent decree was actually um, uh, developed so that uh, children who did not speak English would have actually the resources, uh, the support resources so that they could actually, you know, succeed in school, their parents could come to school to talk to somebody who would, under would understand them. Um, so, Though they have become more invisible as a population in many instances because of this undocumented status, their problems in a way have become bigger and they are pretty much more marginalized. That is also coupled with the fact that our identities in this day and age uh, are actually defined through consumption. And so we are leaving also you know, great uh, numbers of these young people who, whether we like it or not, you know, they cannot even belong at the level of consumption uh, and, and, and feel as American as they are because they are also born in this, in this country. Uh, and so there, you have the intergenerational conflict because the parents cannot provide, because the parents don't understand English, so the child becomes a translator of documents, so the authority is reversed, and that creates a lot of, uh, of issues, uh, mental health issues, uh, in, in fact. So I would say, unfortunately, that the, uh, <laughs> that the picture has not uh, improved. In fact, I think we have gone backwards. Um, we need to also add the, the great migration or the non-traditional migration of indigenous populations from Mexico, Guatemala, uh, etc., uh, where you know many of these new migrants do not even speak Spanish, and well, you know many times, of course, don't speak English. So we have much more um, uh, challenges from the from the education health uh, sectors. And um, as uh, Elisa was saying, I now focus on indigenous migration from the state of Hidalgo to uh, the city of Clearwater. That's the main focus, you know, for, for the last 20 years. Uh, from like 15 uh, individuals, now we're talking about 20, 25,000 uh, new migrants of indigenous descent. And uh, that also presents more challenges at the level of culture, the level of language, and the level of services. So if you have any ideas as to how to, 
and deal seriously with what we have in hand. You know, we go and buy our strawberries, and uh, we go home and we forget, you know, that uh, what those strawberries truly um, uh, represent. This is personal. I'm here in memory of Angela Tanner, Willie Mae Williams, Louise C., Betty Woods, and Amanda Swift, all African-American farm workers who died over the last two years. The people in this book lived the life that you just saw in that movie. Sorry. I know them. They're my friends. I talk to them every day, I work with them every day, I know their stories, and they lived what you just saw. I've known them for 15 years, and every time I talk to them, I hear more stories. And the stories I hear are unbelievable. Geraldine Matthew, who's in this book, talks about how when she was a young girl, her mother traveled the seasons, and they would have to go up to North Carolina and Virginia on different farms. And on the farms they were staying, the farmer would take the chickens out of the chicken coop and put the farm workers in at night, and that's where they had to sleep. She talks about how they would go to stables and they would take the horses out at night, and the men would sleep upstairs, and the women would sleep downstairs, and they would sleep on the hay, just like you saw in that film. So the stories that you saw just now, it's not from the 1960s. A lot of those people are still alive right now. And you can't talk about farm work in this country without bringing in the issue of racism, especially in the South. Because the reason, one of the main reasons, that the farm workers are under these kinds of conditions, because agriculture in this country today is the legacy of slavery in the South. If you look at, there's only two kinds of workers that are excluded from the National Labor Relations Act and the Fair Labor Standards, and they're domestic workers and farm workers. And that's the work that the, that the African Americans, that the blacks did on the plantations when we had slavery in this country. They worked in the plantations owners' homes, and they worked on the plantations. Far agriculture in this country is the legacy of slavery, because after slavery ended in the South, most blacks had to become indentured servants. The people in this book, their grandparents, and sometimes their parents, were indentured servants before the Civil Rights Act passed. Agriculture is always trying to find a way to grow cheap food for this country, and to do that, they need a cheap, exploitable labor force. For many decades, that cheap, exploitable labor force was largely African American, and on the West Coast, a lot of Asians. And when African Americans got the rights under the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s, a lot of them were able to get other opportunities, and that's when uh, there was the Bracero program in the 1940s, but in the 1960s, there was the real change from black to brown. But one thing that this, this uh, film did not show was pesticides. There was no talk about pesticides in this film, and the people that I work with, the reason that they're not here today is because all the people I work with are sick. I work with African American farm workers who were exposed to some of the worst pesticides that are now banned, including DDT, which is an organochlorine pesticide, and the people that I all work with today is, Geraldine is in dialysis today. Geraldine, Linda, they have lupus. Not only were there no bathrooms in the fields, there were no protections against pesticide exposure. The laws to protect farm workers from pesticide exposure weren't passed until 1992. 
They weren't implemented until 1995. That was years after the worst pesticides were already banned. So Geraldine, Linda, Betty, Mary Ann, Mary Tinsley, all the others in this book, and many, many, many more were exposed to the worst pesticides when there were no bathrooms in the fields, there was no hand washing water, there was no drinking water, and nobody trained them about pesticides. They would take home empty pesticide barrels and use them for barbecue grills because you saw the conditions in this film. They would take home empty pesticide barrels and use them for barrettes and for flour to put in their, in their pantries. And so they were exposed to high levels of pesticides day after day, year after year. And we know now that those pesticides can cause problems in the second and third generation. So you saw some of the kids in that film? Beautiful, right? Some of those kids could end up with learning disabilities, ADHD, we know that now. And some of them could have long-term consequences like Parkinson's disease, cancer, birth defects, etc. So in addition to all the other abuses about wages and housing conditions, we also had the conditions of pesticides. I want to show you one more thing and then I'm going to stop because I could go on and on, but I won't. This is an orange picking sack. The people that I worked with not only picked vegetables on the farms on Lake Apopka, they also picked oranges. When this is full, the sack weighs about 85 to 90 pounds. Imagine going up a, a ladder that's leaned against an orange tree, climbing a 12 foot, a 20 foot, sometimes a 30 foot ladder, up an orange tree, hanging from this ladder, picking oranges and filling this sack, and then coming down the ladder, and this includes women, coming down the ladder, having to go over to a big bin, dump out the oranges, and then go back and do it all over again all day long. Today, 2015, for a sack of oranges, Farm workers get anywhere from 75 to 90 cents. Today, 2015. Next time you go buy orange juice, think about that. I'm going to stop there. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Leonel Perez. Um, I'm living in Mokali right now. Y quiero compartir con ustedes básicamente esto. Y I remember the CIW, the Coalition of Mokali Workers. And I'm looking forward to sharing with all of you. Oh, and my name is Elena Stein. I work with the Alliance for Fair Food, which is the ally network to the CIW, also based in Mokali, and I'll be interpreting. E Es una lástima, ¿verdad? Estamos aquí viendo todavía y vivimos viendo estas condiciones que ya pasaron del, que vimos del video desde el año 60. It's a pity, really, to be watching this film and to be seeing the conditions that existed in these years and have existed since. Pasaron 54 años y todavía vemos estas condiciones y... Creo que vinieron generaciones por generaciones y esta generación me toca. This, this film was 54 years ago. Generation after generation experienced different deplorable conditions. And now it's my generation's turn to experience conditions in the fields. Trabajo en el campo, he visto las condiciones y estoy de acuerdo con todo lo que se ha mencionado. I am a farm worker, I work in the fields. I've experienced conditions in my own skin, and I agree with everything that's been said about what kind of conditions persist today. Las mismas condiciones creo que me obligó a estar sentado. And it is precisely those conditions that demanded that I sit here today. Cuando yo, la experiencia que me involucré un poco con la organización era cuando vi que las 
mujeres o trabajadores no tenían ese derecho de expresarse, de decir cuáles son sus derechos, porque son despedidos inmediato en el trabajo. Some of the specific moments that inspired me to get involved with organizing the farmer com community was when I saw the way that women farm workers were treated in the fields and the kind of harassment that was received, lack of respect and inability to speak up about it lest they be fired the next day. Uno, una experiencia bien clara donde estaba yo trabajando al lado de dos señoras mayores que, que yo y también mayores que el contratista. I remember one experience very clearly where I was working in between two women who were older than me and also older than the crew leader for whom we worked. The women stopped very briefly from working to talk about how the lunch hour had passed and to say, when are we going to eat? Y él dijo, ¿y por qué paran de trabajar? Si vienen a hablar, ¿por qué no se quedan en la casa? And the crew leader said to them, why have you stopped working? Did you come here to work or did you come here to talk? If you came here to talk, then you should have just stayed home in the house and can do that tomorrow. Las señoras se agacharon y siguieron piscando tomates. The women fell silent and continued to pick tomatoes. Y yo me levanto y le digo, pero están hablando porque es hora de comer. And I stood up and said, but they're just talking about the fact that the lunch hour has passed. And he kind of came out, the crew leader kind of got in my face and said, oh, you want to defend the women, huh? Well, let's see what you can do. En ese momento, yo no tenía otra manera que seguir trabajando. Y el siguiente día, yo fui despedido del trabajo. In that moment, I realized I didn't have a way to keep working, and the next day I was fired from my position. De ese momento me involucré con la organización, empecé un poco a trabajar voluntario, voluntario, y estoy aquí. It was in that moment that I began working with the coalition of Immokalee workers to organize to change the conditions of experience, and today that brings me here. Y estamos aquí también porque hemos creado una campaña por comida justa. Quiero explicarles cómo funciona. And I'm also here because to confront the conditions that we've experienced, we created the campaign for fair food. And I just want to break that down for a second. Bueno, básicamente, para mí, el punto de vista, no sé si se puede ver. Can everyone see this? Como trabajadores. Estamos siempre aquí. In my perspective, farm workers are always here at the bottom. Y arriba de nosotros vienen los contratistas, supervisores, o que, que tienen un cargo en la compañía. And above us come the crew leaders and the supervisors and the others that have specialized jobs in the farm. Y arriba de nosotros están los rancheros. And above the supervisors are the growers or the farm owners. Tu voz solo tiene que quedar aquí, no puedes subir arriba. Your voice must stay here at the bottom. It cannot go up any further than that. Entonces, crea esta situación donde tú no puedes pedir a uh, descanso, donde tú eliminas todos tus derechos. This creates a situation where you cannot, you do not have the right to request a rest or to, to take a moment. Your rights have been eliminated. Y en el 1993 empieza la organización a tener organizarse en muchos tiempos donde tuvimos, queríamos un diálogo con los rancheros, sentar en la mesa y cómo eliminar esos tipos de abusos. So when we as farm workers began organizing in Immokalee in 1993, we spent our time focusing on how do we get, how do we achieve a dialogue then with the farm owners to talk about the elimination of these abuses on the farms. Pero ellos no quisieron tener ese diálogo. But they didn't want to have this dialogue with us. Pero también Vimos después que arriba de ellos había grandes corporaciones que tienen una enorme ganancia sobre el trabajo. But years later we focused on the fact that actually there is a, an entity above them that has more power that makes enormous profits. ¿Quiénes son? Who are they? McDonald's. Uh, sí. Seguro. Publix. ¿Quién? Publix. ¿Quién más? Who else? Walmart. Taco Bell. Trader Joe. Walmart, Taco Bell. Ah, no, al fin. Ya ni se puede contar cuántos son. And we can't even count how many there are, right? 
cuando nosotros trabajamos nos mandan tomate de tamaño, de color y tomate fresco. These corporations demand tomatoes in bulk year round. They want a specific quality, a specific size, and at their artificially low cost. Entonces, ¿por qué estas corporaciones no pueden demandar derecho justo para los trabajadores? If they have the right to demand all of those things, why can't they also demand just conditions for farm workers? Nace la campaña que pidiendo directamente a ellos un centavo más por libra de tomate. And from there, our campaign for fair food was born, where we demanded that the giant food retailers at the top that profit off our exploitation more than anyone else pay one penny more per pound for the tomatoes that they sell in their stores. Que básicamente piscamos en una cubeta de 32 libras. We pick tomato buckets that weigh 32 pounds. Y eso es básicamente lo que queríamos, un aumento de 32 centavos, que hoy el promedio es de 50 centavos. Today, the average piece rate for a 32 pound bucket is 50 cents. So, in demanding one penny more per pound, we were demanding a wage increase of 32 cents per bucket. And we also demanded that we, as workers, would create our own code of conduct in the fields that corporations would respect by purchasing their, by uh, conditioning their purchases on compliance with that code. Y los mismos trabajadores tengan esa oportunidad de vigilar sus derechos. And finally, that we ourselves as workers would have the right to implement, to oversee, to monitor the, these new conditions. Hoy en día hemos traído a 13 corporaciones. Today we bought 13 major food retailers to the negotiating table. Pero no han llegado solos con la presión de muchos consumidores, de mucha gente que ha estado con nosotros en las calles. But we didn't bring them to the table alone. It came with the pressure of countless people, of countless consumers and organizations and people of conscience that stood with, with us in the streets. Está, por ejemplo, el restaurante de comida rápida, McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Taco Bell, Chipotle. Y supermercados también, lo que es Cherry Joe's, Whole Foods, Walmart y Fresh Market que está participando en este programa. Proveedores de comida, Armark, Sodexo, Bon Appetit, y Compass. So those first were the largest fast food corporations, the second were supermarkets, and the third, the largest food service providers in the country. Y cuando ellos participan, hoy en día está participando el 90% de los ranchos en la Florida. And that was enough pressure at the top to bring 90% of the Florida <coughs> tomato industry to the table too. Hemos creado nuevos derechos de los trabajadores en ese 90% del De la so on the 90% of Florida's tomato farms, we've created entirely new rights for workers. Se el salario mínimo. We have guaranteed the right to minimum wage. Si uno no gana por la de que if a person doesn't receive the equivalent of minimum wage for the piece rate equivalent, the company is required to compensate them for the difference. Zero tolerance, de acoso sexual. Zero tolerance for sexual harassment. Historically, women have known that if they speak up, they'll be fired. But today there are market consequences for a grower's failure to properly address sexual harassment. Nosotros mismos vamos a trabajar con los trabajadores, miles de trabajadores repartimos libros de nuevos acuerdos, de los nuevos derechos. And we ourselves as farm workers have now won the right to go onto the fields on company time, on company property, and talk to our fellow workers about these new rights that they have. Ya hay un nuevo día en este campo de la Florida en lo, a base de tomate. On the tomato fields of Florida, we're seeing a new day dawning. Y con poder de ellos, este año vamos a extender el programa en otros estados como Norte Carolina, tal vez Virginia o Nueva Jersey, donde se produce el tomate en el verano. And with this power that is building, we are hoping now, beginning this summer, to expand these new protections to the tomato fields in other states like North Carolina and Virginia. Y también en, en el otro año es posible en otros vegetales aquí en la Florida, tal vez en la fresa. And next season, it's possible that we may be able to expand these protections to other, other crops in Florida, 
perhaps strawberries. Hemos logrado esto y vamos a seguir presionando a Publix, que es el otro que no quiere participar en el programa. But though we've achieved this, we now have to continue pressuring Publix to join the Fair Food Program to ensure that we have the ability to expand such protections. Wendy's, que es el número 5 de las grandes uh, restaurantes de comida rápida que no está participando. Wendy's, which is the only of the five largest fast food corporations in the country, to not have agreed to join the program. Entonces, eso es lo que estamos haciendo, pero yo les pido a ustedes de lo que hemos escuchado, lo que hemos visto, que no tengan lástima de los trabajadores. So that's what I want to share, but I also want to say that between everything that you've seen today and heard, please do not take pity on farm workers. Queremos que apoyen en cualquier campaña para mejorar a difer diferentes uh, en trabajos, en diferentes condiciones que se puede mejorar. Rather, what we want is your commitment to stand with farm workers as we struggle for justice in the fields. La mera verdad, para mí a veces da lástima cuando uno tiene que hacer fila, pa, fila para ganar un plato de comida en diferentes lugares cuando tú trabajas todo el tiempo. The truth is, it pains me to see myself or fellow workers have to line up to receive food when we work full time putting food on the plates of everyone around this country. Eso es lo que hace Publix, se dedica en localidad, pero nosotros queremos justicia y queremos que podemos trabajar y ganar con un sueldo justo, así poder vivir en una condición, poder tener una vivienda más digna y tener una vida de familia donde pueden, todos pueden tener mejores condiciones de vida. That's what Publix does. They give out charity, trying to avoid our petitions for justice. And that's not what we want. We want to be able to live dignified lives. We deserve, with our hard work, to be able to put food on the tables for our families and do so with our heads held high. Vamos a tener una acción aquí en St. Petersburg el, este sábado. Vamos a repartir algunos volantes si están interesados. Vamos a un desfile y un concierto. And on that note, we're inviting all of you to join with us, to stand with us this Saturday as we have a major mobilization here in St. Petersburg, the parade and concert for fair food. And we'll pass out flyers. Gracias. Thank you. All right, so thank you all so much. Um, we have time, about half an hour, for questions. So questions from the audience. Oh, sure. Sure, sure. Jeannie. Um, I just want to say one other thing about agriculture in this country. Um, I think it's really also very important to understand um, the power of corporations on agriculture in terms of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. Because Getting farm worker rights is extremely and vitally important, but as long as agriculture continues to exploit the environment and people and all of us with chemical pesticides, then we're all being affected. So at the same time that a lot of um, the, the, the large growers and the large corporations have an effect on farm worker wages, as long as the big chemical pesticide companies and the, the six major chemical companies are Bayer, BASF, Dow, DuPont, Syngenta, and Monsanto, we are all being affected by pesticides in our environment and on our food. And no matter what we do for farm workers, as long as they are continuing to affect the environment, because if the, the U.S. Geological Sur, uh, Survey did a, um, a study, a five-year study of the, in the entire United States, and they did soil and water samples all over the country in rural areas, agricultural areas, and urban areas. There wasn't a single sample in the entire United States that they studied that didn't have pesticides in it. Everybody in this room probably has pesticides in our systems. So as long as, so we can, if we continue to do agriculture the same way that we're doing now, 
Not only are farm workers going to be affected, but our envi environment for everybody is going to be infected, affected, and so are our, our health and our lives. And there are a new class of pesticides now called neonicotinoids. And I don't know if you've heard about the bee populations that are being uh, decimated because of pesticides. Well, they have found high levels of neonicotinoids on the leaves of orange trees in Florida. If this pesticide is killing bees, what's it do what is it doing to the health of farm workers? And what's it doing to the health of all of us? And in terms of strawberries, I just have to say this and then I'll stop because I think, I think it's really important to understand the power of the other corporations. Unfortunately, pesticides tends to be overlooked. And it's a really serious problem for everybody, not just farm workers, but for everybody. I stopped eating strawberries 15 years ago because Canada will not allow imports of U.S. strawberries from the United States into Canada because U.S. strawberries exceed Canada's pesticide levels. So if that's true, what are those pesticides doing to the farm workers? We need to change the way we do agriculture. Okay, sorry. Thank you. You know, we had a very brief discussion about citizenship. Uh, one of the most striking um, um, ethos, uh, system of values of uh, farm workers, whether they are Mexican, indigenous, or just rural uh, farm workers, or Central Americans. Uh, one of the strongest, most powerful definition of citizenship is through work. It is because they work that they should be given the rights to live a decent life. Uh, you know, that they can actually collaborate with other communities or their communities, local communities. So it's a very different notion of what citizenship is all about. And here we have something like some people call a stealth sense of citizenship, right? It's something that doesn't exist. Sometimes it exists because we go and vote that we have detached this notion of commitment and responsibility to be able to put food on the table, help your neighbor. And that is a definition, a very strong rural definition of citizenship, both in, in Mexico and in Central America. But that the color of the population, of the farm worker population changed, and also the needs, the culture, the language, uh, and the challenges. Um, but there were very many different new challenges. As my colleague here said, you know, since the 1960s and because of the civil rights movement, many African Americans started the exodus towards the north. Uh, you know, so that's when the, um, especially Mexican farm worker population started getting in to the fields to work. So you start having you know, issues with uh, not only health, but education, language issues. Right, uh, also in the back. Yeah, my question uh, is for the CIW, and certainly anyone else can uh, offer input on this. But one of the things I have appreciated about the CIW is this is a movement from the bottom up. It's led by the oppressed. All too often decisions we make are not decided and with, with, with the input of the oppressed, of the worker. And uh, tell, talk to us a little bit about why solidarity is so important. Bueno, creo que tenemos las mismas conexiones con todos de estar trabajando juntos. I think that we all share connections between all of us to, to be working together. Cuando nosotros vimos que las corporaciones tenían poder sobre esto, vimos pero quién nos va a ayudar y, deci y decían pero cómo van a enfrentar ustedes como trabajadores del campo a corporaciones como, como ellos. When we first realized that it was these giant corporations that really controlled our exploitation, 
we thought to ourselves, but how are we going to be able to go up against these enormous behemoths? Y nosotros empezamos a organizarnos en diferentes universidades, en organizaciones, en iglesias. Y la solaridad fue lo más importante para nosotros cuando gente empezaron a presionar a Taco, el Amazon, a Zabur. And so we started talking in different community groups and universities and churches and other institutions. And it was that solidarity from other people who were affected in a different way that we were able to create enough pressure to reach these corporations. Cuando uno va a consumir veces, no, no empezamos a, a ver dónde vienen los productos, simplemente empezamos para usar. When you as a consumer are eating your food, how often are you thinking about where it comes from? Or how often are you just eating it? Y tenemos una gran conexión con los trabajadores que hay un gran trabajo atrás de todo esto. But you have such a strong connection with the worker that picked that fruit and put it, brought it to your plate. Entonces fue una conexión, una solidaridad que tanto la gente nos apoyó en esta campaña, por eso hemos logrado donde estamos. And it was that realization of our intrinsic connection as a result that people were able to build that solidarity. And it was because of that desire to stand with us that we are as far as we are now. I wonder um, what connections CIW has to other farm worker movements like Flock from the organizing committee in North Carolina or uh, the United Farm Workers. Are you, do you see yourselves as a very different organization? Do you see yourselves as collaborating? Bueno, nosotros estamos enfocados aquí en la Florida, pero ahora que tenemos que expandir el programa, Flo creo que es uh, un sindicato, si no me equivoco. Yeah, well, we are working here in our local context of Florida, um, but it'll be, an, and, and of course we've always collaborated, and uh, as we expand, we'll be looking at that more. Creo que es un and Flo is a, a union. Y creo que ellos se dedican lo que es el tabaco. And they focus on the tobacco fields. Y en Norte Carolina, en otros, la temporada de tomate puede durar hasta un mes y medio o dos meses máximo. And in uh, the fields of North Carolina, the tomato season is about, you know, a month and a half. Entonces, months. con el programa que vamos a pedir, creo que tenemos que ver otras organizaciones, cómo podemos comunicar y... Cómo poder trabajar en esto si se expanda y no solo en otro estado, tal vez en otro, a todos los estados, en todo el país después. But if we are to expand this program, it will be local groups that decide to hold it and, and implement it, make it work for their communities. So we'll be looking at who is interested in, in bringing those protections and, and collaborating with us. Y el sábado creo que es una manera de ver quiénes están apoyando nuestra campaña porque muchos vienen y lo que estamos pidiendo es que organizaciones vengan con su bandera y identifiquen quiénes están participando, apoyando. This Saturday I think is a great moment to see all of the different groups that are involved in this, that care about farm worker justice. If you can come, we're inviting you to bring a banner representing your group so that you can show that you are in solidarity with farm workers. Y nosotros no somos un sindicato, lamentablemente no se puede aquí en la Florida, como se menciona. We are not a union. Uh, unfortunately, as was mentioned, we were excluded from the, those collective bargaining rights many years ago, in the 30s. Entonces, vamos a ver otra manera de, de trabajar en otros estados. So, we'll be getting creative about how it is that we work to implement these rights in other places. I'm a sociologist, I'm residing in Miami, and I've done three different surveys, one of them in Macaulay, with farm workers, and also focus group. And I have two questions. Uh, one of the things that I found out, like in Macaulay, you have the, the tomato packing plants. And uh, in the interviewing, in the, during the survey, a lot of the population there they are women. It was surprising to me how many women are farm workers, and you can see their faces. Uh, with full of darkness, you know, from the, and, and amazingly, some of them working, uh, we measured everything, 
365 days of the year, not even on Sundays, especially those that work uh, in, in Miami. In, anyway, I couldn't believe it, and they, and they, they do. But my question, two, two questions. One is discrimination by age. A lot of these women were telling me that, you know, they observe when they're in the parking plant, if they're not fast enough, what they do is that they reduce the time that they are hired. So that by, at the end of it, uh, they can't make any money. Now, how do they stay? If they have, and this goes to, to your point about citizenship, I didn't find any American citizens. They were all, I mean, everybody is, but they are legal. So I think we have to stress that because there were a lot of them that could work because they have a special status. The Haitians were legal. So even though they were older women and they have reduced, they hardly make any money, but they get some money from the state. And they also, I did study for rural neighborhoods where they were building at that time the housing projects that are subsidized and made a, a huge difference if they can enter into this job. So I think uh, the, the two ideas that I have, that, that I don't know one question if you're doing anything about age discrimination. Because for instance, the, the Guatemalans in Florida, they are more a Central American than in the rest of the country. They're more diverse. Like half of them are Mexicans, but the other, the other half are mostly Central Americans. And the Central American women were not documented, so they, they, was, they, were, they were not at all, but they were really were discriminating them, and they were saying, we are going to have to come back to our countries because it's not enough. They have reduced the hours, and that's it, because they are not as fast. The Haitian can't stay. They're not Americans, but they're legal. And then they have, uh, we have two pages of, of questions about different legal status where they can stay in the country and they can access those terrific housing projects. So in Miami, there are many of them. And it makes a huge difference when they have to live in this trail that they have to pay by, some of them is by week, uh, as when they have these housing projects where they can get freely, freely they don't migrate anymore. Once they get those housing projects, they start migrating the school, they send the children to school. I mean, it's a total different picture. Just getting some type of legality. In 1986, they did it. They, they, they have that. And so, so when I was doing the surveys, this is 30 years after, I couldn't find any, any person that was a citizen, but there were many that were legal, and they were mostly young people. And my, my, own, uh, my own idea is that once they reach 40, and I talk with some of the men about that, it, it's such a hard work that all men don't resist. So those that were given amnesty for agricultural work in 1986, they're gone. You don't find that anymore. So, so I'm just wondering about what you are doing in the union about some type of legality for their works, their workers in agriculture, create a legal program for that so that they can have the, the other benefits just by having legality, not citizenship. Because that's too much in the future. By that time, they're already old people. You know, it's very hard. You, you can find them, but legality they can get. Lo que quería mencionar lo que es la, la discriminación en diferent, diferentes edades sí ha habido y, y yo lo reconozco, yo tenía mucho, hace siete años que a mí siempre me escogían a trabajar. I just wanted to first say I absolutely recognize that there is a lot of age discrimination and it, you know, seven years ago I was chosen very easily as a young person. Y, Pero ahora con el programa que estamos creando, cada trabajador tiene que tener una tarjeta para ponchar la hora de entrada y la hora de salida. Y no puede ser despedido en cualquier momento. Tiene que haber un motivo por qué no va a trabajar el día de hoy. But now on the tomato farms, through the Fair Food Program, you have to, as a worker, you have the right to punch in and punch out at the end of the day, which means that all hours that you are on the job are for the first time being compensated for. 
And as well, you, you cannot be fired uh, without just reason. Antes te escogía, oh, tú vas a trabajar, y siempre me escogía a mí, y personas de 40 años no los llevaba porque no había un control sobre esto, pero hoy tiene que haber eso, tiene que estar registrado el trabajador. Previously, the way that people were working in the, in the tomato fields was, you know, we all gathered around and they'd say, oh, you, and you, and you, and I was always chosen. And anybody 40 and above had a very hard time getting picked. Today, that's working very differently, where now we register directly with the company rather than just being picked up by a crew leader. Y, y, bueno, y también el español es mi segundo lengua. And Spanish is my second language. Tengo otro idioma indígena. I speak an indigenous language as my first language. Conozco a trabajadores, nos comunicamos y parte de la organización como parte del staff o los que están apoyando voluntarios son como cinco o seis lenguas que se manejan en diferentes uh, idiomas. And between us as a, a group, a community of workers, there are five, six uh, languages that we all speak, indigenous languages we all speak and share. And you speak perfect Spanish. Thank you. <laughs> the Farm Worker Association of Florida is a statewide farm worker organization, and the two things are two uh, major programs are pesticide health and safety of farm workers, and that includes trying to change pesticide policy and trying to get um, uh, alternatives to pesticides and sustainable agriculture and more organic agriculture. But our other main area of focus since the organization began in 1983 is immigrants' rights. And we've been fighting for immigrants' rights ever since the organization began. Um, in 2006, we were really close to getting ag jobs passed. And ag jobs would have given a path to citizenship for farm workers, all farm workers in the United States. I'm sorry, that was 2005. We were really, really close. We almost had the votes in Congress to get ag jobs passed. And then the Sensenbrenner bill came right before Christmas in 2006. And that was the beginning of the big anti-immigrant movement that hit the United States. And 2006 and seven were when the big uh, um, immigration, you know, the millions of people on the streets for immigrants' rights and, and citizenship um, happened all around the country. And since then, unfortunately, it's really gone downhill. Instead of getting better, it's gotten, it's gotten worse. Our organization continues to work on a state level and on a national level um, for immigration reform because we have seen a big change. Our organization is multi-ethnic, so we're Haitian, Hispanic, and African American. But we have seen a big change since 2006 um, for uh, uh, immigrant farm workers, um, documented and undocumented, being a lot more afraid to speak up and speak out for their rights and make complaints when there's violations in the workplace because every year they're getting more and more afraid and more and more in the shadows because the anti-immigrant sentiment is so virulent, it's just, it's, it's horrible. So one thing that our organization is doing, and it's definitely not a cure-all because we are fighting on the national level for immigration reform and still hoping that it's gonna pass someday, but on a statewide level, I don't have any petitions here, but you can go to our website and sign the petition. That's floridafarmworkers.org. We're, we're fighting for um, driver's licenses in this legislative session in the state of Florida. We're fighting for driver's licenses for uh, undocumented workers so that at least farm workers can drive without being afraid of being stopped and pulled over for being brown and, and then being deported because they had a headlight out or something. Um, so that's one thing that, that we're doing. So, um, you know, and, and, and other, we're fighting for kids care. We've, we won in-state tuition last year for, um, you know, for undocumented uh, uh, young people. Um, so uh, those are incremental things. Um, we are supporting DACA and DAPA, the President's Executive Order. In fact, our organization is, when, when the court stuff goes through, hopefully it'll go through positively, we are gonna be doing DACA and DAPA ap uh, applications for farm worker families. So I don't know if that's, you know, that's definitely not a cure-all, but we do need immigration reform in this country. It's a huge problem. Can I ask you a question about sure. that? Mm -hmm. uh, I know a Tampa Times, a, a paper here, I, they have an article that documented that there is a legal, a legal way to come. And they went to Mexico. 
the way to come is that the the farm the farmer uh, actually pays the way to the person. They cannot move from one to the that, other. That's the that's the guest oh. worker program. And and that nobody likes it. The farmer don't like it, and the people don't like it because they can, if they don't if they they get stuck with the terrible farmer, they can't stay, move. Stay for the next session. I'm sure um, okay, uh, Rob Williams will be talking about okay, that. But so it's, my <laughs> my question: This act, the, the new legislation that you're fighting for. Uh, does it have that kind of... Well, that's, that's a big... I'm glad you asked that question because um, uh, the, that keeps getting worse every year, too. The, um, when we talk about comprehensive immigration reform, our organization um, has not been real happy with some of the proposals that have been proposed over the years because that, uh, what Congress has been proposing oftentimes is an um, expanded guest worker program, and that is unacceptable because the guest worker program is a way to bring people here, exploit them for a certain period of time, and then when you're done with them, send them back, and while they're here, and the guest worker program is expanding all over the, all over the United States. In Florida, it's expanding into agriculture, it's displacing um, domestic uh, farm workers, and then people are tied to that employer. If they make a complaint, they're not allowed to come back. They can't change employers. It's, it's a very problematic program. And our organization does not support an expanded guest worker program, or it's called H2A. That's a short answer. It's a much longer uh, you know, uh, answer and question, but our organization does not support an expanded H2A. There's all kinds of problems with it. A number of the corporations that are have signed up, like Trader Joe's, operate nationally. Um, is there an effort nationally to, to, to tackle this? Um, or on a federal level? Sorry, would you mind clarifying your question? You're saying rather than going state by like state, is there a way to do the entire federal program at once around the whole you're, country? You're taking a state by state approach, which I understand that you'll be you're collaborating with those other states to make some of these changes um, and because of some of the corporations that have already signed on here in Florida like Trader Joe's is there an effort to get those companies to do this on a, on a national scale um, or federal legislation that you're trying to tackle? Bueno, esta, bueno esa es la básica la meta desde que empezamos en Florida y después expandir el programa, pero seguro que va a ser en todo el país con el tiempo si hay más corporaciones que quieren apoyar esta campaña. Well, that's certainly the goal, is to have worker protections for any farm worker around the entire country. And uh, we are, we're, we're working towards that vision. Y tal vez no solo en el tomate, tal vez en otros vegetales. And of course, not just in tomatoes, but in any fruit and vegetable. Pero ha sido... Estamos hablando desde que empezamos la campaña, desde que empezó la decisión son 20 años y hasta hoy te hemos logrado, entonces estamos yendo paso por paso, pero cada vez más rápido. But, you know, it's been 20 years that we've been organizing and struggling for these rights, and we've just in the last few years achieved these extraordinary gains in the Florida tomato fields. So you've got to go step by step. Pero más rápido. But with every step we go quicker. Empezamos poco a poco, pero ahorita ya vamos este año directamente a otros estados y así vamos a seguir haciendo hasta que todos los trabajadores puedan vivir y que vivan en paz dignamente con la familia. We began slowly, but you know, this year with some of the recent agreements, we're now talking about expansion to other states and going at a rate that's much more rapid than just a few years ago. So, you know, so long as we keep on persisting, keep on that path, we hope that one day all farm workers will live in dignity. I'm glad you talked about pesticides because when I set up Florida Rural in 1966-67, one of the first issues I tried to tackle was pesticides. And I contacted Professor Dykeman at the University of Miami, who is one of the outstanding pharmacologists in the country. And he took a look at it, and the problem was we couldn't tie causation to the individual worker. And we still can't. Uh, later, I was a pallet lawyer doing workers' compensation, and the lawyers doing workers' compensation couldn't make the tie-in. 
It's very difficult. It has to be the elimination of the pesticides. It's the only way you're going to, uh, to handle that uh, problem. The other thing I just want to throw out for everybody, uh, and maybe we'll talk about it a little bit in our panel, we always think of farm worker compensation in terms of the peace rate. And it's always been organized in terms of the peace rate. How about thinking about farm worker compensation in terms of annual wages? When we talk about you know, what is the wealth of individuals in the middle class, we talk about how much do they make on an annual basis. And uh, it doesn't matter how you get there. But if you have a certain <coughs> annual income, you can live decently. And if we just concentrate only on peace rate, there are freezers, there's rain, there's the price of crops go up and down. Uh, if it's all tied to the economic ability of the farmers to pay, we're going to be stuck perennially in the same cycle. Uh, I have some other ideas about it, but I won't go into it. Can I just say one thing? I want to tie what you just said in the previous um, uh, pre previous question or comment. Um, right now, um, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency is um, pro has proposed last year they proposed um, improved worker protection standards for farm workers. The WPS have not been updated since the 1990s. And um, so right now, actually right now, the EPA is um, looking at uh, over 200,000 comments that were sent in on improvements to the worker protection standard. So another action that you can do, and something that would relate to pesticides, and that would be a national action that would affect national legislation. Um, you, we, we work in collaboration with the Pesticide Action Network. You can go to their website. They have a petition on Cesar Chavez's birthday, uh, which is March 31st. We're going to be delivering that petition to the White House. A petition from um, from every from the public, and we have a petition from growers around the country that support stronger protections for farm workers. It's definitely not as good as it should be but it's a lot better than it is now. Right now, farm workers only have to be trained every five years on pesticide health and safety. Farm workers, in addition to the Fair Labor Standards and the National Labor Relations Act, they're also basically excluded from OSHA, which is really ridiculous. Um, and so the worker protection standard is definitely not as good as it should be, but it is an improvement over what we have now. Right now, there is no minimum age for being able to handle pesticides. And um, EPA proposed making a minimum age of 16. We have advocated for it to be no less than 18. So we're fighting for that. And there's, I could go on, but there's lots of other little things in the worker protection standard that are better. So you can go on to the Pesticide Action Network website. There's a coalition of eight organizations around the country and other organizations too, but there's a core group of eight organizations that are fighting to get the worker protection standards improved. And that would affect farm workers about pesticide exposure all over the whole country. So. So, um, I think, unfortunately, we should end it there in order to give time for our next panel to set up. But thank you all for coming, and please thank our panelists.